Hello! Welcome to the Gamer's Closet. I'm your host, Douglas Weed, and today we're going to be talking about Yellowstone. Yellowstone is a game manufactured by Avalon Hill in 1985. It is a point allowance movement game. Uh, this game here was actually manufactured with the coordination of Yellowstone National Park. The uh, game itself uh, seats for two to four players, runs for about an hour, and is rated for ages eight and up. So let's dig into it a little further, shall we? In this game you play as one of four possible herds, either bison, bighorn, sheep, elk, or mule deer. The object of Yellowstone is to move your herd from its winter range to its summer range, collecting as many food points as possible. With the onset of fall, the players must make the return trek from their summer range to their proper winter range. After winter conditions are applied to all herds, the number of surviving herd members must be adjusted in relation to the remaining food points. Finally, points are tallied for each herd member that are still in play, and players with the most animal points wins. The game also came with a behind-the-game book, actually on the National Park itself, printed by Avalon Hill and the Yellowstone Museum Association. The book has a lot of different photos in it with different aspects of the National Park. It has a lot of information on the different animals that you do see in the game. It covers camping, backpacking, and what to do on the National Park and in the off season. It also has a suggested reading list to find out more information on the National Park itself. The game comes with the following pieces. 46 large printed cardboard animal counters, 40 small printed cardboard animal and food counters, one playing board uh, containing the map and seasonal event charts, two six-sided dice, one four-page rule book, one pad of scoring worksheets for calculations, and one gamer's guide to Yellowstone. Before play commences, a number of counters must be placed on the map board. First, turn all food counters number side down. Mix them thoroughly and place them still number side down one to a hex on the hexes listed for food. Please note that there are more food counters than the listed hexes. Place the surplus food counters still number side down to one side as they play no further part of the game. Next, place a single healthy coyote counter in each hex marked coyote. Finally, each player must place their herd on the board in their respective winter ranges. Each herd is identified by the picture on the counter as well as the distinctive color. Blue for bison, purple for elk, green for mule deer, and red-orange for bighorn sheep. This color matches the border that defines the herd's ranges on the map board. Please note that the shade of the counter indicates the type of animal in the herd. Darkest for the adult males and the lightest for the young. Each animal counter has two sides, one with a white cross above the face to indicate an injured animal. All animals begin to play healthy and are flipped to the injured side as directed by the rules. If and when healed, simply flip the counter back to its healthy side. At the beginning of play, each herd consists of three males, four females, and two young. More young may be born throughout the game and other members of the herd eliminated and replaced, but the restrictions of the counter mix are always enforced. Males and females must be placed in separate hexes. Each young must be placed with a female, or both may be placed with a single female. Simply place the smaller young counter atop the female counter. Throughout play, this convention will indicate that a young is accompanying a female and will move with it. Beyond these rules, any animal of the herd may be placed in any hex of the winter range. All animals begin the game healthy. Players roll the dice to see who will move first. The one with the highest dice roll will commence play, and the first season begins, which is spring. A couple of key things about the map need to be mentioned before game starts. Uh, there are four types of terrain, clear, forest, lake, and mountain. They are significant for playing the game. The geyser in the upper quadrant of the map has no part in the game as it is merely decorative. The hexagonal grid is superimposed over the terrain features in order to regulate movement and positioning of playing pieces. The type of terrain within the hex determines whether the animal may enter the hex or may indicate that the animal may not move further than that turn. The terrain is always considered to be the slowest type whenever two or more coexist. For example, many hexes have clear terrain as well as mountains or lakes and forests. These hexes are not clear but are considered the other type if present. 
Beyond these terrain features, each herd has a winter range and a summer range. These are outlined by the same color as found on their counters. Any and all playing pieces may enter the hexes on the range. The colored borders do not interfere with movement in any manner. Also found on the map board are the seasonal event charts, which determine events affecting the herd during each game turn. Food points must be accumulated in order to enable as many of the members of the herd to survive the winter as possible. Players may keep track of their food points on a scoring worksheet. Food points may be earned in a variety of ways. The food counters which were placed at the beginning of the game may not be moved. These may be picked up, however, by simply moving any animal of the herd through the clear terrain hex in which the counter is placed. The animal need not stop but may continue its movement if possible. The face-up side of the counter reveals only the presence of such a bonus. The reverse indicates the actual number of food points that the counter represents. This value should be revealed only at the end of the game and not before to the other players. The player can simply place the counter in front of them until the end of the game to tally up food points. Any food counters still on the map board at the end of play are ignored. When the first member of the herd reaches any hex within the boundaries of the summer range, the player gains 25 food points immediately. Circle this on your scoring worksheet. When the final surviving member of the herd reaches any hex within the boundaries of the summer range, the player gains 50 food points immediately. Circle this number on the scoring worksheet. For each turn during the summer that the entire herd begins within the summer range boundaries, the player gains 10 food points. The player may simply mark the number of such turns on their scoring worksheet and then multiply by 10 at the conclusion of the game. For each turn during the fall that the entire herd begins within the winter boundaries, the player gains 5 food points. The player may simply mark the number of such turns on their scoring worksheet and then multiply by 5 at the conclusion of the game. Food points may also be randomly awarded by the seasonal event charts. These should be recorded on the scoring worksheet as they occur. Food points may also be lost during seasonal event charts. As with any addition, these should be recorded on the scoring worksheet and then subtracted to the final conclusion. Yellowstone is played in turns, each player taking their turn in sequence with play proceeding clockwise around the board. Each player will conduct their turn in the same manner. Each player's turn has three distinct segments. One must be completed before moving on to the next. First, the player whose turn it is will roll two dice and consult the proper seasonal event chart. These charts differ from season to season. The event that is directed by the appropriate chart must be immediately applied. Next, players will move members of their herd. You don't have to actually move members or use your full movement value. But once an animal has been moved, it may not be moved again in the same player's turn. All movement must be completed before proceeding to the final phase, which is the predator phase. Finally, the player will roll two dice to see if they're allowed to move a predator. If the type of predator that they're allowed to move is in play, they may move any one of that type. Though they are not required to move that predator, nor are they required to use all of the movement points. Should the seasonal event chart have directed them to move a predator, and the dice roll allow to move a predator of a different type, the same animal may move without penalty. Upon conclusion of predator movement, it is the next player's turn. They repeat the three steps I've just mentioned. Play proceeds in this manner until the last surviving herd reaches the winter range at the end of the fall season. As directed by the seasonal event charts, new young may be occasionally added to the herd. These must be placed with a female that already occupies a hex on the map board. No more than two young may ever be with a single female in a hex. Young animals may not be voluntarily abandoned by the females in spring or summer. However, as directed by the seasonal events for spring, a female may be forced to abandon a young, or an eliminated female may leave young still on the map board. The young may be voluntarily split from the female during the fall. In all cases, a young can freely rejoin any female of the herd if both are on the summer or winter range. Also on the map board will be various predators. These are the carnivorous animals that prey upon the herds of Yellowstone. All predators are of the same color, distinguished from one another by their picture. Predators do not belong to any single player, other than the coyotes that commence the game in place on their dens. They may be placed on the map board only when directed by the seasonal event charts. They must be placed as directed, usually the mountain lions and grizzly bears on their dens, and the human beings on any winter range hex. 
Predators are moved by a player in one of two instances. At the beginning of each player's turn, the player may be entitled to place or move a Predator as directed by the seasonal event chart. All Predators commence play healthy. Predators may be moved in the same manner as the herd animals. However, only one Predator may be moved at a time. The following limitations are placed upon the movement of each type of Predator. Mountain lions may move five spaces injured, uh, they may move four. Grizzly bears, uh, healthy, they move four spaces injured, they move three. Coyotes move three spaces injured, they move two. Human beings, healthy, move one. Injured, they move zero. Some predators are very territorial. Grizzly bears and mountain lions may not be moved into any hex that is adjacent to a hex occupied by a healthy grizzly bear or mountain lion. This limitation is applied without regard for terrain or season. However, either animal should be injured, they may be moved into the same hex, in which case the injured predator is immediately removed. Predators may also be moved as the last activity of a player's turn. The player rolls two dice. The number rolled will indicate that he may move a certain type of predator, as I will list now. All rules for the movement of predators still apply. If the proper type of predator is not on the board, there is no movement of a predator during this turn. If you roll 2 through 5, you move a coyote, 6 through 7, a grizzly bear, 8 through 10, you move a mountain lion, and 11 through 12, a human being. Unlike animals of herds, predators can move into hexes containing other animals, with the exception of mountain lions and grizzly bears, as I've already stated. If the predator would normally enter the terrain of a hex and has the movement to do so, it may end its movement on an occupied hex. The uninjured predator can then kill an animal if allowed. The animal so killed is removed immediately from the map board. Only healthy predators may kill other animals. Two injured predators have no effect on each other, even if in the same hex. Human beings can hunt any animal. Coyotes can hunt any injured young. One young of any injured female or any unaccompanied young. Grizzly bears can hunt any injured animal, all young of any injured female and any unaccompanied young, and mountain lions can hunt any injured animal, all young of any injured female or any unaccompanied young. Please note that in the fall season, no predators except uninjured human beings may take any uninjured animal, including the young, who are now old enough to defend themselves. At that time, all predators but human beings may take only injured animals. The herds face many numerous dangers beyond predators. The wilderness is a very unforgiving place and injuries to both hunter and hunted are common. The weak and wounded rarely survive. In any situation where the seasonal event chart demands that an animal be injured, immediately flip the counter over to the injured side. All injured animal counters are readily recognizable by the broad white cross on the counter. Beside the fact that injured animals are prey for predators, they move slower. Each individual injured animal has a movement allowance one less than normal. For example, an injured mountain lion moves only four hexes maximum. An injured male of a herd moves only three hexes. All other rules for movement still apply. Animals remain injured until eliminated or healed. Animals may be healed only if directed by the seasonal event charts. Animals which suffer a second injury while injured are immediately eliminated. Each animal in the game is able to move up to its movement allowance once each turn, but need not move at all if the herd's movement is insufficient or the player does not desire to move it. Each herd may expend up to 10 movement points unless limited by a seasonal event. Any number of animals in the herd may be moved, so long as the total number of hexes moved does not exceed 10, nor an individual member exceed its movement allowance. The following limits are imposed upon each member of the herd regardless of species. Males, if healthy, move 4, injured 3. Females move 3, if injured 2. Females with young move 2, if injured 1. And young move 2, and if injured 1. In the fall, young traveling alone may do so at the rate for females. Uh, example, three hexes if healthy and two hexes if injured. During movement, no animal may move through a hex occupied by another animal. 
There are two exceptions to this. The first, a young may accompany a female of the same herd, limited to two young for each female, or join a female once on the summer or winter range. And second, a predator may be moved into a hex containing an animal. In some cases, this will result in the elimination of one or the other animal, as I just explained. These are the only two exceptions to the rule prohibiting animals from entering hexes containing others. Some animals are adapted better than others to move movement in certain types of terrain, uh, as I will uh, go over in a moment. For the mountain hexes, the bighorn sheep, mountain lions, and grizzly bears may move freely through the spaces. The bison may not move onto mountain hexes at all. As for the elk, mule deer, coyotes, and human beings, once they land on these spaces, they must immediately end their turn as the terrain hinders their movement. As for the lake hexes, the bison, elk, mule deer, mountain lions, grizzly bears, coyotes, and human beings all must end their turn if they move onto one of these spaces. The bighorn sheep may not move onto these spaces at all. As for the forest hexes, the bison, elk, mule deer, mountain lions, grizzly bears, and coyotes may move onto these spaces freely. The bighorn sheep and human beings have terrain hindrance on both of them and must end their turn uh, once they land on one of these spaces. The game encompasses all four seasons with variable effects, notably in terms of the seasonal event charts. The seasons in sequence are as follows, spring, summer, fall, and winter. When you start a new season, players will read the seasonal events for that season. When spring starts, all young must accompany a female. No more than two may be with a female. Spring lasts until one player gets all surviving members of their herd inside the boundaries of their summer range. At that point, summer immediately begins. As soon as summer starts, any herd that begins its turn completely within its summer range during this season gains 10 food points. This is awarded each turn the conditions are met. If after all surviving herd members have arrived, any leave the area for any reason, there is no penalty applied. That player simply does not get the bonus 10 food points. On the summer range, orphaned young can pair with a female. To do so, merely end the young's movement on any female without two already. Summer lasts until all players get their herds completely inside the appropriate summer range. At that point, fall immediately begins. When fall starts, all herds now begin the return to the winter ranges. In the fall, the rules for predators changed, as I've already covered. Young may be separated from females at any time during the season and may travel further, three spaces as opposed to two spaces than usual. During the late fall, any herd that begins its turn completely within the winter range gains five food points. This is awarded each turn the conditions are met. If after all the surviving herd members have arrived, any leave the area for any reason, there is no penalty applied. That player simply does not get the bonus five food points. Fall lasts until all players get their herds completely inside the appropriate winter range. At that point, winter arrives. When winter arrives, there is only one dice roll for seasonal events. This is made by the next player and affects all players equally. Adjustments are made to the food points and the game ends. Following this, players must make their calculations to determine the winner. At the beginning of each player's turn, the player will roll two dice and consult the appropriate seasonal event chart. The number rolled will give a random event which may prove a boon or disaster for the player. All such events should be read aloud and enacted immediately. When a season changes due to the movement on the map board, the next player uses the new seasonal event chart. All players, including those with their entire survivor herd within the appropriate summer or winter range, must commence each turn by rolling on the seasonal event chart. So as I stated before, when winter arrives, the game is now over. Remove all predators and untaken food counters from the map board. It is now time to calculate your food points, your food point need, and your seasonal animal die-off. First, each player must tally the food points accumulated during the game. Next, each player must tally the food points needed for his herd demands. Simply multiply the numbers of surviving animals for each type by their food point need. The requirements for each animal is applied regardless of injury. These requirements are as follows. 25 food points needed per male, 15 food points needed per female, and 10 food points needed per young. 
If the total food point is greater than the total food point need, the players may proceed directly to the next step. If the total food points is less than the total food points needed, enough animals must be eliminated to bring the new food point need below the available food points. These animals are removed one at a time. The choice when one is available, as with injured animals, lies with the player. A die-off priority exists which must be adhered to by all players when eliminating animals. In order, this is first injured animals, second young, third males, and finally fourth females. Following the determination and adjustment to food points for eliminated animals, each player is ready to calculate their food points. The number of each surviving type of herd member should be entered into the scoring worksheet. Each member of the herd has a different value relating to their importance in the combination of the herd. Injuries make no difference in the assigning of these points. The following animals are awarded for each type. 1 point for males, 3 points for young, 5 points for females. By adding these points to obtain a total, each herd can be judged against the other. The player with the highest number of animal points is the winner. In the case of a tie in animal points, the player with the most females wins. In the case where that tie still exists, the player with the greatest surplus, which is food points minus food points need, is declared the victor. If a tie still exists, the game is a draw. Well, this has been an overview on Yellowstone by Avalon Hill. Uh, Yellowstone is a pretty decent game, surprisingly. Uh, it has a lot of animals and hunters and different little things like that. Uh, it's not a normal game that Avalon Hill produces, which they're mostly known for their war games, uh, like Gettysburg and Battle of the Bulge and uh, other games kind of like that. Uh, but they did put out a series of really off games, like uh, Yellowstone here. They put out a game about boat regattas. They put out some sports games. So just because they're not a war game, I wouldn't discount their uh, uh, playability and enjoyment. Uh, this game here... It is a little weird, but uh, for what it is, it's actually a pretty decent game. So uh, if you haven't played a strategy game from Avalon Hill before, uh, I would probably say this is a good starter game for Avalon Hill. Some of their heavier war games are a little more complex, whereas this one's a little rules light. And I mean by that, uh, it's only a couple of pages versus the 16 to 25 page rule books that Avalon Hill normally puts out. So if you want to learn an Avalon Hill game, I would probably start with something like this. Uh, if you haven't played a strategy game before, I would recommend playing this game uh, if you can find it. Uh, it goes online anywhere from about 10 to 30 bucks. So as Avalon Hill games go, it's not very hard to find, but I would recommend making sure that it has all the pieces because Avalon Hill is notorious for being very piece heavy and notorious for having a lot of games that are missing pieces when you buy them online. So uh, if you haven't played this game before, I would highly recommend playing this game. Well, that's it from us here at the Gamer's Closet. We'd like to thank you for checking out our video on Yellowstone from Avalon Hill Games. If there's a game that you'd like us to discuss in the future or go over, please put it in the comments below. Please hit subscribe so that way you can be the first person to check out our future content. And as always, please have a great gaming day.